Hello, everyone. And uh, I hope you had a very great second week in Jumpstart and a very great first week in TNARC and enjoying your courses so far. I'm very happy to introduce today's guest in our lunchtime lecture series. And I'm also excited to welcome all of our guests who are joining remotely today. The first uh, speaker I'm going to introduce is Laura Mich Michelin. Uh, she is a lecturer here at uh, UCLA at uh, Ideas, and she's a creative and architectural technologist in Los Angeles. And uh, she, her research and practice focuses on digital simulation and algorithmic mutations with focused interest in infrastructure systems and climate engineering and uh, also fashion. Prior to joining UCLA faculty, she was an assistant teacher at SciArc, which is uh, another school here in Los Angeles, architecture school, and a project designer at Ishida Ram Studio, where she worked on projects such as the Architectural Beast, Hoax Urbanism, and New Campo Marzio, a creative technologist at Actual Objects, and an energy analyst at Glumac. She has an, uh, a master in science and architectural technologies from SIAC and a bachelor of science in civil engineering from Columbia University in New York. And uh, personally, I have seen Laura teaching over the past few years here at UCLA. She's very much involved in uh, teaching technology to our postgraduate students and has very interesting technology seminars. She's very, she has a very good expertise in kind of thinking about architecture differently. But what I most recently learned is that she actually has a, an expertise in facade engineering, which I had no idea about. So I think she will show you a little bit how you can see architecture from various different angles and how you can, as an architect, dive into different professions, even at different times of your career. Welcome, Laura. Thank you for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, there are so many of you. Wild. All right. So as Yulia said, my name is Laura Michelon. Um, and I like to give myself a little bit of context before any of these kind of lectures, presentations, what have you. And during COVID, I ended up diagramming out all of my work in order to try and find out what are the connections or overarching themes, what, which projects led to which jobs, like what am I interested in and what do I work on? Um, also because I love diagrams. But um, yeah, so it all starts, I got my undergrad degree in civil engineering from Columbia University. I chose civil engineering because I was good at math and physics and I love bridges and infrastructure. <laughs> Um, but I've worked as an electrical designer on projects like Disney Shanghai, the Wilshire Grand. I've worked as an energy analyst, an energy modeler, a sustainability strategist who tended to focus mostly on the building facade. Um, and then I have my master's from uh, SIARC in architectural technologies. Teaching at SIARC now, of course, I teach at UCLA AUD Ideas in the postgraduate technology studio. Um, I also have my own kind of architectural technology practice and studio in downtown LA. So today I'm going to try and show you the range of my work by looking at a few projects from opposite ends of the scale, the urban scale and the human or body scale. So let's start with urban scale. Um, whether we as designers like it or not, we're already surrounded by multiple layers of technological and ecological infrastructures. Researching these hyper-legible mega engineering projects isn't just about some fantastical cyberpunky sci-fi utopian city, um, but instead comes from like a genuine curiosity about the complexity of the systems that surround us. So the first project is phytogeography. What is a nation state's border to a kelp forest? Instead, what if we traverse the border between brown kelp and red seaweed? This map is of a speculative future where borders are no longer defined by nation states or politics, but instead renegotiated through the locations inhabited and claimed by plant species. So using machine learning, Landsat imagery, NOAA maps, phytogeography, or the study of 
the geographic distribution of plant species and their influence on the Earth's surface implies a new planetary scale shift in the understanding of where we exist. From this aggregation of data, phytogeography aims to create an aesthetic interface, making the borders of planetary biology more readable. Um, and then I got to show this piece at Tetrapod Gallery during Fulcrum Fest last year. But this piece is actually part two of a project that started more as a research project, um, looking at the systems of cow and cattle farming and specifically the feed that are inputs to that system and then the outputs as well. But um, this started last year when the IPCC released their report on advancing carbon capture and sequestration. And then a few months later when the US released their methane reduction plan. Um, I think we are, I spend a lot of time thinking about CO2 emissions as the main culprit for anthropogenic climate change, but methane actually accounts for 30%. And in the report, the IPCC was explaining that one ton of methane in the atmosphere has about um, 80 times the warming impact of a ton of CO2, which for me was kind of a game changer because I've been like hyper-focused on carbon sequestration for a long time. My thesis was actually incorporated direct air capture into um, apartment units. But um, this project kind of aimed to connect the systems of large-scale seaweed farming of brown kelp for carbon sequestration and red seaweed for the addition to cow feed in order to reduce methane emissions. The diagram is showing the traditional system of how cows get fed versus what I'm proposing. I think a lot in diagrams, so you're going to see a lot of diagrams. <laughs> Um, the proposed site just north of us off the coast of Ventura um, extends inland to near around Bakersfield. I used uh, CycleGAN, which is a machine learning model, to transform and manipulate satellite imagery of the area into a proposal for locations of seaweed farming, as well as areas that would be used as nursery pools and seaweed spore incubation. And ran it through a variety of other Landsat models to help extract information about what seaweed type could be grown where and then how that would connect back with dairy and cattle farming in California. Um, this project is the Future World Visions Megacity 2070 video game that was done in collaboration with the American Society of Civil Engineers and Experimental. Um, so Megacity 2070 is an immersive 3D digital experience that allows you to visualize the future by placing you at the heart of a plausible city in 2070. It's designed to help foster a new way of thinking through plausible scenarios presented in a provocative way that drives civil engineers to be stewards of new technologies and innovations while responding to environmental and societal challenges. For me, this is actually a very poetic project uh, to work on um, because I was basically hired to bridge the gap between new me and old me. <laughs> um, hired as someone who understood what the dev team needed what the art director was asking for, what the civil engineers from the ASCE were giving us, and then what the lead researcher had found. Um, I joked that I basically got hired to do the math for this project. So to make sense of the data, to be sort of a mediation layer between large amounts of data and specific targeted nodes and metrics. So I spent months in just Excel and uh, had no say in the aesthetics, which was very interesting for me. Um, the urban scale also makes its way into the academic world for me as well. This is, these are three projects from a workshop done at AVS Seoul, the island and the grid infrastructure systems in the city. Um, this workshop was taught by me and Case Miller. It was a cross-disciplinary project between film and engineering. The goal was to use technical research, narrative building, and intelligent agents to analyze and mutate city infrastructure systems within a defined city area, and then design a simulation or adaptation of that system that then interacted with the area of the city across multiple scales. We had some awesome ones that looked at snail ecology, wetland development, MRF to food delivery systems. Um, this project is by Hongil, and he was looking at the process of transforming landfills into islands, um, which is on a 20 year kind of temporal scale and um, yeah, so transforming landfills into islands that might then become park space later. And here at UCLA um, with Cuban Josel, I ran the Maximum City Studio. Um, so there are two projects within the studio that I'm gonna show. The first is Maximum Emissions by Denai Sanya and Sruj. 
which was terraforming a fracking site in Cooper Basin, Australia. Um, they were using algae and plant life to first clean the water that came out of the fracking site, remediate the soil, and then introduce new forms of ecologies. Um, afterwards, here you can see some images of the different forms of algae that they were using in their project, and then a concentrated solar tower. And the second project is Maximum Data by Chiping, Yatian, and Yitong, which was tackling the problem of what if um, you needed to host the data from the, all of the European Union in one location or one area. So this is in the Orkney Islands. Um, thinking about the energy requirements, security, ease of access, temperature, all of that. They did host a lot of it underwater, which is kind of fun. And then this is Neural Net City with Studio Kinch done for the Seoul Biennale, which explored the transformation of existing Seoul City plan based on extrapolating currently proposed or already implemented smart city technology. Um, the focus of this transformation was on how digital forms of government and perception allow us to rethink traditional boundaries within cities, whether those might be urban and wilderness, public and private, um, and the different program types within the city. As digital sensing and governing become more prevalent, what sorts of alternative thresholds might be established in place of a traditional city or design? Um, this had a 1 to 2,000 mixed media master plan model and an interactive media piece that incorporated 3D sensing and 2D cameras. And then for the human scale, the opposite end. The first project is explores the implementation of machine vision and intelligence to re-examine existing couture collections to produce speculations on fashion. I have always been interested in fashion. Um, I think there are a lot of similarities to architecture and talking about form, tectonics, movement, and scale. But the scale of fashion makes it inherently faster and more manageable, especially for some of these tests. I also love kind of the superficiality that can come with it. Sometimes it could just be more fun and more impossible. Um, this project is really me working through a process of generating and reinterpreting fashion using neural nets like CycleGAN, StyleGAN, PIFUHD, the variation of segmentation models, UseNet, fusion models. Um, and I'm definitely drawn to the distortion and mutation that come from using and misusing these tools. These were some of the first that I did within the project, generating the sketches, and then to interpret them, drawing out the 2D pattern of what it would take to reconstruct them, and then reconstructing them in something like close 3D. More specifically about the face, but um, this is my machinic reflections piece. Um, where I trained an image classifier to in real time categorize your face based off of 16 categories. Most of them were job titles. One of them was not. Um, and then reflect it back at you through a mirror. So it asks, do you look like an artist, an educator, a conspiracy theorist? Do you embody these classifications reflected back at you? Algorithms exist um, everywhere. And with a varying degrees of intelligence, manipulation, data, and occasionally malice. The data set of this piece was very important to me. I made it, I chose the categories. I found 400 images of each category. Most of these are scraped from LinkedIn and then trained it. So my bias is everywhere, but so is LinkedIn's and so is everyone's self-imposed categories of what their job title is. The piece is accompanied by two masks that are AI generated representations of my face. Um, I kind of view this as a breaking apart the process and putting it on display. My piece makes you look at your reflection and the algorithm's understanding of you and think about it. Like, do you agree with it? Probably not. Okay, why? Um, but in fact, the first person that I didn't know who looked at it got lobbyist and was so angry. And I had to explain to him, like, that's okay that you're angry. Like, the point of this is to think about how these algorithms are being used and the bias behind it. And he was just like, but why a lobbyist? And I'm like, I, I don't know, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this project then turned into a class I taught this last spring here at UCLA, um, where we investigate, investigated a range of classification machine learning models and explored a variety of mass making techniques that might help us to embrace, enhance, distort, or hide from the classification. The masks or proxy faces served as a type of tool or prosthetic through which the user could disrupt their classification originally deemed by the model. 
So it was really heavy on research and testing, using different materials, form, lighting, and detail, then building a specific mask based on kind of what their goal was for the reading. And then they each had to take photos of themselves, of course, in the wild, <laughs> wearing them. Uh, I had way too much fun in this class getting homework. So yeah, some of them were so much fun. Um, yeah, so no real conclusion, but that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nor, for your really inspiring uh, lecture. And uh, also, it was a brief insight. I very much enjoyed seeing seeing the project. Um, next, I'm I'm having the pleasure to introduce uh, David Freeland, a long term uh, colleague and friend uh, who is actually um, teaching at SIAC, where Laura studied. So um, I'm very excited to welcome you, David. Uh, David is a principal at Freeland Buck in Los Angeles and uh, design faculty at SIAC since uh, 2012. And uh, from 2008 to 2012, he taught at Woodbury University, another university here in Los Angeles where he was instrumental in developing the Fab Lab and teaching fabrication and computation. Established in 2009 with Brennan Buck. Brennan was former teacher of my own in Vienna at the University of Applied Arts. So I know Brennan actually longer than you, David. But um, together with Brennan Buck, who is on the East Coast, Freeland Buck was recognized in 2013 as an emerging architecture practice by the Los Angeles AIA. Prior to Free Freeland Buck, um, David worked with architecture offices in Los Angeles and New York, including Michael Maltzan Architects and Peter Eisenman Architects. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Architecture from the University of Virginia and a Master of Architecture from UCLA the Department of Architecture and Urban Design here. Uh, David, uh, David's research and practice focuses on the spatial potential of pattern systems and um, their objective perspective of drawings, examining contemporary forms of subjectivity in perspective were recently exhibited in the surface tension exhibition at New York Institute of Technology. David, uh, since he graduated uh, from UCLA and has been teaching at SAIC, has been a frequent um, jury member and coming to reviews to UCLA and uh, vice versa. Uh, we go sometimes to SAIC and experience the work there. So there's a vivid exchange between the universities uh, in Los Angeles. And we always look at uh, what this, every student is doing at different schools and what also um, different professors to at different universities. And so for me, it has been always uh, really inspiring to follow um, Brennan and David's work over the years. And I'm really excited uh, to, to invite you to lecture here today. Welcome, David. Okay, so I, I'm here, hello everyone, to let you know that architecture can be dangerous. Um, myself being an example, as I uh, stumbled and fell on a job site visit a couple of weeks ago, and hence my uh, position today behind the behind the walker with a broken leg. Um, regardless, uh, it's a delight to be here and have the opportunity to share my work um, and to talk with uh, Laura and and you all uh, about your interest in architecture. Um, so I, I guess I wanted to start by giving a little bit of an overview. I think similar to to what Laura was doing about. Uh, how I got started in architecture. And as Yulia uh, mentioned, thank you, Yulia, for that, that introduction. Uh, I am a graduate of, uh, of the AUD here at UCLA and actually met my partner here at, uh, at UCLA um, uh, while we were here in, in grad school uh, from 2002 to 2004. Um, we didn't start collaborating until later. I'm happy to answer any of those kinds of questions. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, these moments when you're you're at school are especially productive ones, and there's tons of opportunity and um, really exciting discussions happening. So I'm going to try and bring some of the, those discussions that were happening at that time up today, um, starting with um, this slide, which 
There we go. Um, okay, so uh, I just have two images up here to look closely at. Um, and I, I wanted to kind of start out with this uh, notion of visual acuity and precision as being something that's uh, fundamental for us in architecture, my partner and I. Um, and in doing so, I'll point out these two images that we have here. So the one on the left is um, the Caribbean hunt. Uh, and uh, this is written about by um, several theorists, including Ken Frampton, um, as a kind of a tectonic moment. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Um, I think it's mine. Did I do it? It's probably my fault. Resume. Resume. I can see it from here, guys. Can you help me here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. We're green. All it's nice. Yeah. Um, about a kind of tectonic moment of architecture. So let's let's think about tectonics in architecture as being about separate parts and the way those separate parts meet together. Um, and so for Frampton uh, uh, and talking about the Caribbean hut on the left-hand side, a building expresses culture through the representational and ontological status of that detail, of that moment of meeting. The assembly of each part of a building coalesces at the intersection of lines at these points, which may alternately reveal or conceal the real construction and the distribution of forces in a building. In other cases, the detail is an expressive and often idiosyncratic moment in which the meaning of the building is inscribed, the timeless expression of lines and corners. Um, on the opposite side, on the right-hand side, we have uh, Greg Lynn's embryological house. Greg Lynn uh, was uh, an instructor, still is an instructor at, at UCLA, an important one for, for Brendan and I. Um, and his uh, embryological house had a very different approach to this problem of tectonics, the way that things meet together, the way that parts come together in architecture. Um, for Greg, uh, tectonic assemblies are successful at producing connections, but ineffective at producing continuity. Um, and so his interest in, in this project, which is kind of related to the blob, is an exploration of continuities between surface and space, created volumes that are formed without the um, discrete points and tectonic details that you would find at the tectonic, at, uh, at the Caribbean hut. These uh, subtly curved surfaces or surface gradients create an infinite number of orientations where the tectonic produces a discrete number. These gradients produce complex spatial effects. So th this idea about tectonics, the way that parts come together, really formed some of the initial thinking that we had in our practice. Um, and let's say kind of launched our, launched our work in a way. So I wanna talk about a couple of early projects that we did. Um, Sorry, this is still, there we go. Um, beginning with an installation project. Um, this is the slipstream installation. Um, and this was done kind of very early on in our, in our collaboration and around these kinds of concepts of how do, how do things meet together? How do, how do parts meet together? And how does that relate to the way that we build now um, using let's say digital technology as opposed to analog technology? Um, and uh, this was a kind of um, interest to bring those two ideas together. Um, the discrete part on one hand and then the continuous form and fluid graphic on the other. Here we go. So uh, this is a, a front view of that installation. And it really uh, kind of set up two different ways of understanding the project. Um, alternately, one viewed from the street, which is a view on the left, which we could call an extrusion, let's say a set of lines that are extruded and pushed back through the gallery, versus the view on the right, which was the lateral way of understanding that installation. Um, trying to suspend these two ideas on top of each other. One, which has to do with the intersection of points and lines, and the other, which is about um, continuous graphic and fluid services. Um, so this kind of idea motivated a good deal of our early work, and this is um, executed not just in the context of the gallery, uh, but this is a, a restaurant here in Los Angeles, which was interested in these kind of different ways of seeing 
um, and really started to introduce this idea of seeing and being a perceptive viewer as an important part of the work that we were trying to make. Um, so in this case, the kind of uh, dichotomy between looking down the length of this uh, sandwich shop, um, where you can see the kind of the undulations of a series of uh, ceiling scoops, light scoops that are coming down, uh, versus looking at it in the opposite direction, where you saw the actual kind of infrastructure of the different light components um, and the, the kind of filigree of the image that was being developed along the, uh, uh, along that wall. So intentionally kind of setting up these, these two different ways of, of seeing the work. Over time, this is this is developed and taken on some different kinds of forms, um, which I'd like to continue to talk about. I think this is one thing to note is that architecture seems like something which is solid and um, has a degree of uh, permanence to it. But in fact, the way that we're thinking about work and the way that many architects think about the work is constantly evolving. In other words, the architecture is a kind of project um, which has a, a life of its own and that this, this life is something that's developing over time. Uh, so this is a, a, a project that we started looking at a lot more closely uh, in the last five years. Um, it's a series of uh, ceiling frescoes that were painted by Andrea Pozzo. Um, and so the thing to know kind of first here is that this is an image of the same space taken from two different points of view. And that the, the those paintings that um, look so three-dimensional and perfect on the left-hand side uh, are in fact flat, right? They imply a kind of depth um, and that depth aligns from one particular point from other points of view it breaks down, it produces other kinds of alignments and other kinds of spaces. We thought this was really quite interesting that two-dimensional surface may begin to interact with the three-dimensional space of architecture in such an exciting way. Um, and uh, we developed this uh, through a public art kind of installation. Um, we were selected, this is a, a competition to install a ceiling installation at the Renwick Gallery at the Smithsonian uh, in DC. Um, and our proposal was to archive a set of contemporaneous ceilings to this building that we were installing within. And so we made a series of drawings um, and all those different spaces are pictured here. Philadelphia City Hall Council Chamber, the caucus room. Uh, what we were interested to do is to uh, redraw what the important uh, architectural moments were at this period uh, of time um, in the history of ceilings, let's say, in uh, in the United States. The Renwick Gallery can be in, being built uh, just at the end of the 1800s. Um, and so in redrawing it though, we thought that we could add something new. Um, in part, the idea being that people will recognize these ceilings and may be familiar with them, but we thought that we might be able to construct a kind of um, three-dimensional puzzle, um, one which you could unpack if one were to look closely at those ceilings, uh, meaning that the projection of those drawings three-dimensionally into space and floated up above your head would construct a series of points of view um, which did not necessarily align with the ceiling centers. Uh, and so became, the exhibit kind of became a collection of these different ceilings, uh, these kind of two-dimensional drawings drawn up, uh, kind of scaled up to the scale of the entire room as a way of uh, reproducing these different forms. Um, here's a couple of shots of the, of the exhibition. Uh, nine total ceilings that were overlapped to produce these, uh, th this kind of uh, catalog in a way. Um, of uh, different ceilings, but, but also at the same time, a kind of new tapestry. This idea we developed further for the Pittsburgh um, uh, Children's Museum. They had a, a similar kind of project. Uh, they were interested to uh, put a ceiling installation in, in the main lobby of the, of the museum. Now, the museum was in an old Carnegie library what we found interesting about this particular space is that there used to be this beautiful leaded glass ceiling in the room. Um, and so the interest was, 
how could we begin to really evoke the qualities of that ceiling in, in a new and different way, um, but, but do so in a way that was also maybe somehow familiar, again, with this kind of interest in uh, visual um, acuity and, and spatial complexity. Um, and so th this is a drawing that the images up on the top here are the images from the original Carnegie Library. Um, and then the projection of that into the space from a very particular point of view. Again, a kind of multi-layered uh, construction to create that kind of sense. So from the perimeter of the gallery, what you were able to understand was this kind of hanging tracery of the, the previous ceiling. Um, but from the center, from that point of view, perspectively, uh, one was able to understand three-dimensionally that, that space of the, the previous uh, library, one that was really very expansive and filled with light. Um, and so this, this kind of furthered the, the, the interest uh, also uh, through visual acuity of engaging people, engaging people to move around spaces and to understand them from different points of view. So just kind of giving you the, the full kind of tour of the office's work in a way. Um, I also want to point out that these kinds of ideas we developed uh, at the scale of buildings as well. So these are, um, we have a, a series of commission projects for, for clients that are asking us to follow some of these ideas, uh, but at the same time also respond to particular sort of requests that they have. Uh, this is um, a house we call the second house because it's the second house on the property. So look at this, this diagram here on the left-hand side. We have an existing site uh, with a house, existing house that was sitting in the middle. Uh, client interested to build a second house, totally disconnected from the first one within that very limited buildable volume in the backyard. Um, uh, the, the sort of interest, though, was in creating a kind of exterior space around which the house would revolve, that it would be an indoor-outdoor space, um, and that this would become central to the house. And so what we developed was this idea of a kind of flipping back and forth between exterior and interior spaces. You can see in the three interlocking masses and then in the three exterior voids. Um, so in process, uh, as a series of models, you can see here the, um, these kind of three different volumes, three kind of spatial uh, um, collections of, of program in the project, uh, and an interest to create a kind of continuity through its texturing, then maybe a distinction in terms of the spatial volumes. The, the house itself is not, it's not two-sided. Um, sorry, it's not, it doesn't have a clear front door. Um, the front door, because it's in the rear of the property and because it borders in Adley, has kind of two sides to it. And so we are interested to kind of mimic those qualities in the house itself. Um, here's an image of the overall house. And of those two entries, we can slide into the space. That's that central courtyard that became the, the space around which the rest of the house is really formed. And, uh, and a couple more photos that suggest what the interior looks like. Um, what we found to be kind of interesting about this was that we were really quite frustrated with the images themselves, the photographs and what they were able to describe about the house. So in as much as, uh, let's say the earlier uh, projects I was talking about were interested in looking carefully at images. What we found is that looking at carefully at images of this particular project did not necessarily reveal the spatial agenda and the complexity of the interior, the way that those boxes were um, intersecting with each other. And so I think this maybe is something that uh, architects have to do quite a bit. We have to do here, right, as we're representing our work. Um, for you all to see is that you have to image your own work. And so um, this became a kind of project unto itself um, in which we were thinking about other ways of imaging this particular house, taking photographs of it and thinking about um, how that described the kind of the three-dimensional experience uh, of the house. 
Um, so from one point of view, these, these photographs were mimics of the ones that you saw earlier, but projected perspectively, um, they took on a very different kind of form in three dimensions. And so the idea was to be able to explore two-dimensional images uh, of the house three-dimensionally to explore other opportunities or possibilities for those photos um, and to um, look at that as a kind of uh, three-dimensional moment, not necessarily one that you could picture on, on a flat screen, but one that was um, occurring kind of in time as you were interacting with it. And so these kinds of images became quite complex as they unfolded. Um, and so I, I think that that has been another really important and interesting thing for the office is not just the making of uh, the work, but the imaging of the work itself and how we how we represent it. So I, I want to talk about one more um, project. Um, this is uh, an installation project that happened at SciArc. Um, really, as you mentioned, I, I do teach at SciArc now. One of the, the great programs that SciArc has is uh, a series of installations that they commission both uh, internal faculty, but then also external uh, architects to come in and um, work on in the, in the gallery. Um, and we were able to uh, approach this idea that was maybe developed in second house and the way that it was imaged um, as, a, as a concept for the, for the gallery install, which we call views from the field. Um, while the techniques maybe were similar to the models we've been shown before, the content is a little bit different. And let me just get a little bit of background about that. So an architect uh, by the name of Walter Netsch, who was working for SOM in Chicago, mid-century, uh, developed this idea for um, addressing the more kind of complex programs that he was seeing clients come to him with. Um, something that he called field theory. And so this involved uh, creating really quite uh, complex plan lattice lattices of uh, different kinds of geometry. In this case, you can see how he would work uh, overlapping these lattices together in order to create much more difficult and much more complex spatial relationships between forms. So this is his uh, biomedical uh, center at uh, University of Chicago. Um, and uh, the thing that was so interesting to us about these is that similar to Second House, no matter how you photograph the building like this, you couldn't possibly describe the complexity and difficulty of spatially navigating that kind of project. Um, and so using, uh, using AI, using other kinds of techniques, uh, we, we went through and we scoured the, um, uh, the archive uh, of uh, images that were taken of this project and others by, by Netsch. Um, and ended up arriving at three that we thought warranted a kind of more three-dimensional exploration of what those moments might be. Um, and in doing so, we, we made a series of these large objects or we called, what we call image objects. Um, and so similar to, to Second House, from a particular point of view, um, you got the sense of that two-dimensional frame uh, around which a particular moment in the project was, was being developed. But as one moved around those three-dimensional uh, objects, there was an opportunity to see it more fully, see other opportunities, see how other spaces began to unfold or fold out of what those two-dimensional images had been. Um, and in fact, in their projection, maybe even the opportunity to open up new spaces, spaces that somehow exist between the two-dimensional image and the three-dimensional uh, space that was being developed. Um, so I, I think I can, I can leave it there um, uh, with this question of, uh, of visual acuity and how we can begin to perceive and understand spaces, uh, images in relation to form. Thank you. Well, thank you both for this really inspiring um, presentations. We're going to move to a Q&A now. Um, so I would like my team to help me switch to the 
the presenters and then we're going to take the please. So I think I have one question to start with while we're switching to the to the view of on the two of you. One thing what I was really realizing when I um, listened to your presentation, David, was this beautiful project you created with ceiling um, tapestry. And I thought about it in a way that you kind of picked up this historic concept of perspective and the, the paintings in, um, in churches and, uh, and kind of way of false perspective and understanding how to translate that, um, but actually in a three-dimensional way with like these laser, like I assume laser cut uh, panels. And I thought actually today, in today's time, the ceiling is something which is often neglected in the design process, but it actually produces so much change for, for a space. And then you, in the next, project you showed you showed the residential projects and um I kind of understood the transition to the perspective change but could you maybe talk about is is the ceiling in your residential projects also something really important or is, was it like more in the kind of exhibition uh in the in the exhibition uh projects uh, the followers or did it inspire you for and then the residential projects also pick more about uh, the two outcomes of the yeah, That's a really good question. Um, so actually, the house, right, the house actually came first. I okay. Even though know, I presented it in the order, and this is um, the thing that architects we constantly are constantly reframing your work in the name of your work, and you try to explain different ideas in the process. And I think that you, you know, pointed to something quite interesting. Which is well, how did we think about the ceiling in the house? If we're so interested in the ceiling summit projects, why not make it here? Um, and so I, I think that uh, I think that we certainly did, uh, but the interlocking of those um, exterior versus interior volumes um, very much was intended to kind of open up the side um, while also kind of closing down and creating these very specific sort of views out from the interior. Um, I guess it, the, the difference between them um, is probably that the, the medium is really different. And I saw that also in your work as well, where the like, medium is so important, especially switching between the two scales, right? Um, and I think that between the two project types as well, like this is the work that this project, for instance, we're looking at the, the ceiling here. Um, the, the fact that the project was the ceiling. As a kind of suspended um, material, not the structure of the ceiling itself, just sets up a different problem to work on. Uh, it's the shape of the space, let's say, the organization of the space, as opposed to the spider delivery of very good acoustic work, let's say. That's what it does. So I, I think that's, that's the, the key. It's like, what is it that you're trying to work on? What medium are you trying to work on? Well, with that, I give to the students and also uh, Don online. If you have, see any questions in the chat, please feel free to um, kind of announce them and interrupt. Did you hear of that, course. Don? Yeah, yes. I hear you. Great. Okay. All Thank right. you very much. <laughs> okay, students first. Uh, why do you choose? Why do you choose the red, the red algae? Yeah. Red algae. Um, yeah. So the question was, why did I choose red algae to be the cow? Um, I kind of didn't choose it. <laughs> so. Really excited when I talk about algae. Okay, we'll do that. Okay, um, so that actually comes from research done out of BC Davis, so going on. They kind of explain what they're out there now. They're only feeding 
It's like they're replacing one percent of traditional cow teeth with uh, it actually dried stroma form, which would happen when you cultivate the red seaweed. It has to go through kind of a distilling process and a drying process, and then you can introduce it. Um, so yeah, that that just came to me. That came from I I stumbled upon a research paper, and that's kind of like what started. That coincided with the IPCC report that kind of started this whole research by far. Um, another interesting thing that I wasn't going to bring up in the presentation, but that I feel like it's easier now, is that um, so methane from cows actually doesn't come from cow corn, it comes from cow fur. So that I find it to And that like blew my mind. And that a lot of people are trying to tackle this in terms of product design. You see, we spent waiting in the top hours of cows wearing like masks that are meant to harness methane. <laughs> so, yeah, so essentially, you know, giving the cows a little bit of the dried red seaweed reduces methane emissions by like 87%. Um, so, yeah, you're also doing 10% of the emissions with the taste of the milk, which I find. Uh, we have a uh, we have a question on Zoom. Uh, this person is asking, I guess, both of you, what are some ways you get inspiration for your work and art? Um, is that there are problems in buildings and in, in architecture, you could say, that uh, having an interface between technology um, and maybe more uh, state or uh, traditional ways of, of making projects or making buildings. So I think that really is a, an inspiration point for us, um, which problematizes technology in some ways. In relation to the way that we typically do our work, I am. Um, I think that I am just very curious about a lot of topics, and we can tell I think better than we do it at some scale. So everything we were all about. I think when I was starting, which I am so early, you know, whatever. But it's really scary on what you to it. Like, what do you like to read about in your free time? What do you like that? And so, cool if you would share that with someone, I think that starts to work into other ideas. It comes up and up against other problems or constraints from the design process. And I think that in most of our presentations, we're talking about kind of like overarching themes or themes that carry through to the projects or interests, um, with me and what have you. And I think that that's a bit normal thing for everyone, but it isn't always so clear from the beginning. But you're also really good at analyzing things that you're interested in with the way that they can be explained. Now, is there another question in the chat? Uh, yes, there is. Gustavo would like to ask two very interesting questions, actually. How does technology play a role in each of your architectural research practices? And what new technologies there that are in the horizon are evolving your definition of architecture academically and also for professional. Thank you. Technology is a good part of that. Constant. So it's also then thinking about the category of what even is technology. Um, I think that in different ways, it shows up in everything. I think that since most of my work, a lot of my work is tied to research as well, and there means one of the thinking through either technology or use or um, in terms of technology that I'm excited about. Also, again, I teach in a technology studio in the postgraduate program. So like you name a software, like I'm probably trying to incorporate it or figure out how to use it. But um, what I'm excited about in the future, and to some degree also very terrified about is machinery and AI because a lot of my work is not all of it works with it deals with it breaks it apart and understand it or try to what have you um and it's moving so quickly right now that 
for me, I find that very exciting because um, everything is new all the time, all the terrifying, so everything is new all the time. Um, but then very interesting to come in with scale, that's our picture across, you name of career is affected in every way. So, um, I just sent out a lot of models today that spend on 30,000 different unique objects. And um, you feed it an image and it'll generate the other sides of it, depending on where you look at the camera. So it's not actually giving you a 3D object, it's just generating what it means. I will be able to play. This will be useful. <laughs> so. Uh, I think that the technology quite interesting because frequently people produce a platform for, which is a way of understanding the work that you're doing or kind of ground by which to understand what you're working with. Um, and so frequently I think with social media and just there, um, and in other technologies, the, the proliferation of all these different platforms actually requires you to be able to switch or move between these different spaces in a really fluid way, which is, is very jarring. And so I, I think that um, frequently architects are asked not to produce novelty in that way, uh, but to produce familiarity. And so I, I think that's something that motivates us in relation to novelties. I just strike that balance between novelty and familiarity. Um, and AI is maybe. It's a really broad category because it's so so kind of broad. So but it's um, feels like it's an hour. It's interesting because even when talking about deep familiarization for the last two weeks now, and somehow familiarity is a problem. Um, yeah, I Uh, the question was um, in relation to the CV project of how, how would you take that further? Like, would you propose that? Do you think it would be kind of a bit of travel or any kind of partner for companies to have a silver? The first I'm going to say is probably like, can you talk about kind of, Yeah. Um, this also depends into like, what is the final form of any project? What is their section? Like, it is a program. Drawing, remembering. Research. Like, it depends. Um, and so, one thing is that I was working with a friend who works at a company that deals with carbon sequestration at scale for um, international businesses. So, they will buy like carbon offsets to the earth. So, she was actually the one that was helping me find specific research papers that I needed in order to find some specific numbers. Um, and then looking at locations over where that would work. So she's actually already working on clothing. The ability to increase the physical size to incorporate all those model learning is something that interests me for very good at. So I think that if you're seeing academia, it doesn't mean that it is the real world. I think that so many universities, we work at UCLA at this point. I mean, the amount of research coming out of institution is mind Scale. But but you see Davis is the one that's working with cattle farmers, the government, TV farmers <laughs> in order to kind of like figure out how this might work and there's that respect. So I guess I don't know. <laughs> I was curious about the 3D models of the house.
of the physical models that I had shown were actually made for turned out these were my movies for the contractors, so the contractor would understand the shape. Those models don't exist anymore because the contractor is destroyed them in the process of building the project. Um, so I, I mean I think we we create all different kinds of information for different audiences during the course of a design project. Um, and uh, at the end, what I was pointing out, and maybe this gets a little bit more to what your question was targeting, um, we were not successful felt like in describing what the spatial ambition for the project through the way that we conventionally would have represented the project. So let's say there's some photographs or through a set of drawings. Um, and so that's what you us to try to take a different step there. Um, so yeah, I think the project in the beginning was looking at higher levels of spatial order. Um, and so why did how we able to that in the representation of things as well? Design aspects of things that the biomimicry of interest you and we use biomimicry for your design. Yeah, really trying to this, but I'm going to rephrase some things I talked about. Um, I think that in, in practice, and again, this is a very specific company, we're going to very specific project, so the things I think of them, this is everything. This is my one unique experience, right? Um, I was a bit frustrated with the level of, it's a very surface level of something. I'm going to create the slide here, something with this is like, yeah, I'm going to be a little bit are you or can you look at you know where is this what does this actually mean what does it mean right because i think that then maybe she needs to decide something um i don't tend to use that word which doesn't really matter it might be a little bit more but it's like if the idea is to look at other ways of getting information because how other things are done at different scales with the brain screen and with a lot of RD testing, which we find in the right, um, there are so many different ways to incorporate that information into any process, always, right? And so, even if it might not have the word to it, like I think it's very much, again, researching these you know, other qualities is not a human perspective, it's very interesting, and there's a lot to learn. Cautious that I it seems like it's been inevitably a kind of reduction in capacity. Um, in other words, the, these kinds of relationships are more of the organizations simply see in nature and the way they interact. As soon as you try to sample from that, reproduce it in a better environment, it's inevitably reductive. Um, and it's reductive sometimes in, kind of, in a way that's not very intentional. Um, or not very explicit. So we try to try to say like in the The first one, what's your imagination about artificial intelligence and architecture? <laughs> Um, so I think I do the same the AI model, same machine learning model. It, it, it's quite a thing in terms of everything from that GPT and using the answer of, you know, kind of get the playing with Dolly, like the next image. Really just great for the paper. Um, they're very useful tools. But the intelligence of them, like the intelligence and artificial intelligence, I love what is the training? Like what was the data set that went to it? Like what information did you need in order to give it this intelligence? That's actually it. Um, and so for me, how do we use an architecture? Architects are so good at taking the software that we built for something else 
that you need for your own practice, like this is new for forever. So yeah, share with it as well. So I think it'll be used yet for a range of things for sure. As it will for law as well, engineering for sure. You know. Um do I think that, that means it's gonna replace the well? No. Do I think that, that means that we now need to understand how they work enough so that we can also use them? Some of us, yes, probably for me, yes, for sure. Maybe not the right one at the time. Um, I think my fear with AI, and I say, like, you know, when you think about those features, more that they can be very powerful tools. And so, again, like thinking about writing that data that I'm not going to see what kind of bias is in that as with any tool. Yeah. 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 And I guess I'll just ask it real quick. Um, David, you said you reunited with your friend from theater after grad school, like uh, yeah. your firm. How did that come about? <laughs> That's a, yeah. So, it was, so immediately after UCLA, I went and I worked for um, one of the Ball Civil Conference here in LA. And my partner, Brennan, went and taught with Greg Lynn and Todd Monta uh, in Vienna. And so we, we kind of did that separately for a while, but it was, um, we just got interested to do our own work and we found our way back to some of the uh, independent study work that we had done here in UCLA and started just testing out what, what can we get in life of life to be able to share, share some of the values. Shares that interest, et cetera. And that's that's how it built, it built over time in different players. So was was then um follow-up question. I think it's an important question. Was the ceiling project in the Richthof at the Angewandte actually then, which I remember as a student uh, painting, was that then one of your first projects coming together again? Actually, Brennan did that project prior to us. Oh, okay. I did not. I did not work on that. Project. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Um, I could tell it was. Yes, okay. yeah. Um, I I had an installation that I had done actually here, um, at Woodbury when I was teaching, and the two of them engaged similar things. Was uh, it the wall? It was a separate. Yeah, it was a okay, cool. But it was just separate research. Interesting. Um, at the time. So yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that there's things that are in the air at school. There are things that are happening here while you're here, and you will all be influenced by them. And that um, you see a kind of common set of uh, ideas you know, that you're always going to be talking about. For those, for those I think what's cool about this right now also is I've had similar experiences where I'm friends with with undergrad and get come back in your professional life later and say now at my graduate school and maybe other people are where you guys can also also sounds like you um you're interested in a lot of fields and just started on this doing some engineering which I'm also pretty interested in. And I was wondering how the um, this actually is in some field in the architecture as a whole um so yeah I said it's civil engineering I thought it would be a civil engineer. I actually thought I was gonna get into uh from that because that was like basically how you deconstruct a building in different ways that's very isn't happening for different reasons. Um I like engineering, I like working across the energy modeling world. Um I switched to energy modeling because I was tired of just reading the code about the you know how to incorporate new the new tech that would be kind of more interesting from an into the learning curve than we have to continue with the learning world. Um, but ultimately, um, I think I was kind of very tired of working on other people's design. And I didn't think that both my parents are artists, my brother's an artist, my godparents are artists, so I was just like, 
family engineering. So our session to me seems like a perfect kind of that. Like it's just you think about so many things visually. Um, you have the entire history, like architectural history, art history, everything is kind of influencing it. You have to bring in research, but it also at the end of the day needs to work with physics. Like it needs to have the engineering elements of it in order to stand, function, what have you. So I think that I'm still figuring out <laughs> how all of these things come together. Right, but, but I can say that studying civil engineering did help me in my work, in my interest. Um, but that I'm also happy that I'm not. John, do you have a question online? Yes, um, <clears throat> Min would like to ask how do you navigate designing buildings that are different from the aesthetic of buildings surrounding it? And have there ever been challenges with the community where they prefer to keep their overall aesthetic unchanged or tradition? Thank you. Um, so I think that the person who the and its context is maybe a central question that one uh, engages really with any project. Um, and the notion of context the things that are around it, I know I, I talk a great deal about digi visuality, but there's so many different systems and layers and, and ways you can understand with context and, and building text context. Um, and so I, I, I think that that's part of what you have to engage in when you engage in a particular site. Uh, whatever kind of site it is, whether it's building site, whether it's a gallery um, or, or installation, artwork, or even a research project. How would you choose your battles? Um, what is going to be the point in which you are synchronous with that context? And what are going to be the points when you try to make a difference? Um, and visuality is just kind of one of those points. Maybe it's the one, I mean, as you mentioned, the community or others that are around it, maybe it's the thing that rises to most of the this looks quite a bit different than what is here. Um, but I, I think it's a, you know, as an architect, you have to think about it from a much broader view um, and with a much uh, broader level of complexity than this one. Um, this may be on for both of you a little bit, but I wanted to touch on the idea since we're really pressing on the students the idea of intentionality and making setting up specific goals for themselves and thinking about what why are they making the decisions they're making in the process of beginning to design. And I know both of you I see a lot of intentionality in both of your work. I say that you intentionally choose to work with color um, and also to work with specific materials. I would love to maybe hear you know a little bit from knowing your work, but I would love to hear your point of view of why you choose to make those decisions. And um, for Laura, I think I found it interesting that you also intentionally, even even though now the state of our technology and AI has gone to the point where accuracy is so high, um, sometimes you choose an infidelity and maybe a um, slight ambiguity in the model that you choose, perhaps to allow for more creative process and maybe in that that intentional decision long ish question but just to touch on some of the savings I think it's it's uh, something very tricky in the sense that um uh looking at the work that you're doing at the same time as you're making the work is something in that kind of process of self-assessment is not always incredibly productive. Um, in other words, intentionality but express itself in different ways and being conscious of it and being in control of it uh, many times can actually hamper the process of expression and expressing the intention itself. And so I, I think that um, there are tendencies that uh, are kind of built in with, with, to the approach to the work. Color, I'm going to say, like, yeah, we work with a lot of color and not in a super intentional way, to be honest. Like, we don't have favorite colors that we're working with. 
Um, it's much more about the principles of difference and and whether transitions are smooth or abrupt. And color is a way of signifying that kind of difference. Um, the problem though with color is that it's read in a kind of intuitive way by whoever sees it. Um, and so I think that attention in that sense can be it, it's true with random color work is being colorful, even though we we don't have a specific intention to actually do anything in particular with color. Um, so I, I, I think the, the trick is to um, is to be is to be able to increase the form of intentionality around the work, uh, both at the outset, but then also like we're doing today, we reflect back, right? And so we're we're giving that kind of framework to intentionality looking backwards. So it's a kind of it's, it's a constant process that you have to with. Any questions about the work? Thank you for coming.